Okay, so Don, I know you said bring a fish tank and you probably wanted something optically perfect, but I did bring this fish bowl from, you know, Walmart, but it says premium on it. So I'm assuming it's gonna be optically like Leica certified, no problems. Sure, let's just run with that. It'll be all right? <laughs> let's hope so. Premium, man, it was 1047 with tax. <laughs> Welcome back, Deep Your View TV viewers. Chris Nichols here, and we are joined once again by Don Komarechka. Thank you so much for coming out, Don. Now, last time we did have a lot of fun doing interesting macro work, but you are the, in my opinion, mad scientist of the macro <laughs> world, and you do some amazingly um, beautiful work combining art and science, right? Is that fair to say? I, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, in, in this case, we are really heavy on the science, and then we have right. to find some way to turn that into art, and that's really the magic here. This looks amazing. So we've got like flashlights, we've got inks. I assume we're drinking those later. I don't know. We've got some <laughs> minerals, and of course, the fish bowl you asked me to bring. So are we doing like another macro setup like we did last time? Yes, and there's a few twists along the way. Oh, twists, I like surprises. So what I'd really like to do today is take these ultraviolet lights and experiment with them. You don't know what's gonna glow. You don't know if a flower is gonna glow, you don't know if a mineral is gonna glow. We've got some fluorescing inks. All of these different ingredients, when you hit them with the ultraviolet light, will produce something that is entirely different than we'd normally see with our own eyes. Gotcha. And that's macro magic for you. Now, I've used UV flashlights before, but just to cure resins, these look like serious, like they got warnings on them and stuff. Like what's different about these ones? Well, number one, they're very intense. Okay. Uh, so anything with the Convoy brand on them usually have a very nice clean ultraviolet uh, light source and the cleanliness of that light source the purity of it is really important mm. because you can get cheap ultraviolet lights to uh, you know find dog pee on carpets or scorpions in your garage or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, that that works too um, but it, they bleed a lot of visible light and that oh, would okay. contaminate the results that we're trying to create here so the purer the ultraviolet light source the better the results for photography now I see we've got minerals here. I don't know what we're gonna do about those, but the inks, like, are we doing a rave? Is that what we're doing? Are we painting our bodies, Don? Cause yeah. like, it's been like 20 years. All right, so I think a first easy experiment for us to try today is to use fluorescing minerals. It's just a static object, but when you hit it with ultraviolet light, it's going to glow into some fairly fancy colors. And all you need is an ultraviolet light right. and a fancy rock. Don't cameras block 100% of any UV light coming onto the sensor? They do, but the ultraviolet light that is hitting the subject uh, will make the, um, the rock glow into the visible spectrum. And so while the ultraviolet light is needed to start the process, the camera's not capturing the ultraviolet light it's at all. It's capturing the visible light that it's creating. Ah, very cool. All right, so what do we need to do to get started? Well, we need to kill the house lights, put okay. on our safety glasses because you don't want to get cataracts. Ultraviolet light is not great for your vision. And, uh, and then we'll start playing around with this fun magic. I have to use glasses. How do I look? You look great. All right, so this is awesome. I mean, we're getting beautiful fluorescence uh, throughout all these minerals. It's interesting how they all have different colors, right? It's just because of different chemical compounds, different impurities. Different minerals from different locations will have different impurities, yeah. and that will cause things to fluoresce into different colors. So some minerals just glow like crazy, like it's a carnival going on here. Yeah. Others are a complete dud. But we've got some good ones here, and I think the magic is in the smaller interactions where the glowing bits will change colors or where you have the crystal facets that are glowing onto other things. Like right. it's, it is effectively its own light source. Right, yeah, it's very cool. So I, yeah, I can, I can foresee a lot of just like getting in close, neat abstracts, you know, trying different angles, but yeah, really neat, simple project. Okay, so that was really, really cool, Don. But these are still gem rocks. I mean, they can be somewhat pricey depending on what you find and buy, right? Absolutely. So what's this other setup here? We've got a flower setup, which I think everybody can afford. Um, and we're gonna use inks. Like, where, what are these inks? Are they special? Some of them are. I mean, a lot of these inks are designed for fountain pens or for highlighters. You can refill a highlighter. Do you know you can do that? Like, I don't know why you would. Environmentally friendly highlighter. Uh, but you can buy ink that is designed to, uh, to refill that stuff or some special novelty inks that I have here. All of this is available often from from uh, fountain pen companies, and there's some oh, websites out okay. there that will sell that. What we're gonna do here is take this flower that does naturally fluoresce a little bit, okay. and pollen and flowers will often do that, uh, but we're gonna add some artificial fluorescence uh, to make it look almost like there's a tiny pool of lava inside of a flower. Very cool. Just on a pure lark, just to, to see what happens here, because I've got this all set up and we've yep. got this all kind of configured. Why don't I take a different kind of ink? Okay. Um, this is going to be invisible ink. Okay. I'm just gonna drop another, uh, uh, drop another color in here. Oh wow, very cool. We make our art. Uh, yeah. And I've got blue and I've got yellow and orange and I can combine different colors together, all within the center of a flower, like I'm painting with fluorescence. Okay. 
Okay, so that was all cool, but what is this now? What is the surprise? So this is sort of my, my soapbox moment here. I wanna talk about how effective ultraviolet filters actually are. Right. Now, we know that cameras have an ultraviolet blocking filter right in front of the sensor, so that negates the need to have a very good ultraviolet filter right. in front of the lens. Effectively, like, these become protectors is why we buy right, them, right? But a lot of them are labeled as protectors. Right. That's perfectly fine. I agree with that. That's not a problem. But my problem is when some of them are labeled as ultraviolet filters, and they are not ultraviolet filters at all in any way, or they don't do the job properly. Oh, I've got a few examples here. Um, I picked up the uh, Laowa 100 millimeter macro lens, okay. and it comes pre-equipped with an ultraviolet filter. So I figured that'd be a good one okay. to, to start with. Again, this is a protective measure on this. Yes, of course. Uh, but it says very specifically, MC UV on the right. filter, multi-coated ultraviolet filter. And we filter. see this all the time. Now, if this ultraviolet filter does block ultraviolet light, you will see the blue disappear. Right. Yeah, right. Almost no effect it whatsoever. It has very little, <laughs> if, if no effect whatsoever. So now I have the Zeiss T-Star. Right. Now, quite an expensive filter, right? I mean, this is going to be up there with like Heliopan filters, Rodenstocks, Leicas maybe even. Hundreds of dollars. I yeah. can't remember the exact price on it, and it varies by size. Right. Uh, but if I were to take this filter and put this in front of the, that same UV light source, Oh, it, totally it blocks it entirely. Wow. It is just gone, yeah. right? This is not real world scenario if you are outdoors, but if you are shining these lights at this filter, it's going to create an orangey brown color cast on your image. Hmm. And that's not a good idea. It's the most effective filter that I've seen, but with this fluorescence of it, it just doesn't seem like it's 100% of what I want in a UV filter mm -hmm. either. The next filter we're gonna try here is a Hoya UV and IR cut filter. Right. It does a pretty good job. Okay, Not exactly as good as the um, uh, Zeiss T-Star, mm -hmm. but here's something tricky. If I put the filter off axis, it just comes through again. It lets m more light through. And I don't know why. Oh, if anybody is aware of, uh, of why that happens with a scientific reasoning, uh, I'm sure someone on the forums will Chime in in the us. forums or the comments and we'll, <laughs> we'll see what that is. But it means that off-axis light is still going to get through. Right. And that's not ideal either. Gotcha. And it's important to be aware that even a cheap filter could be good or bad. A good filter can yeah. be good or bad either. Uh, and you'd really have to kind of test it on your own. Great. Maybe even go into a camera store and actually ask them, can I open up the package and shine an ultraviolet light on a right. piece of paper just to see if that one, uh, by your own metrics, by your own tests, is going to suit your needs. So it's interesting too, then it, it starts to terrify me because I'm like, okay, I've got the UV cut filter built into my sensor. Is that going to fluoresce? Is that letting all the UV light through or, or blocking most of it or what? Hey. I don't know if it would fluoresce, but in real world, out in the natural sunlight, the sun doesn't put out as much ultraviolet light as we're right. playing with here. So this is more of a science experiment than anything yeah, that we so would really encounter in the real world. But if you are playing around with ultraviolet lights, you want to make sure that you don't want any of that entering into your camera. Okay, so finally we got the fish bowl. What are we doing here, Don? We got the lights set up on the sides of it. Um, we're not using a macro lens. I noticed that, hey, this is gonna be a little bit further away. A little bit, a little bit of a wider field. You okay. can use a macro lens sure. too, but uh, the 24 to 105 that I have on the camera right now is perfectly suitable for this. Uh, in this case, we are aiming the ultraviolet flashlights at the water. The okay. water itself isn't gonna fluoresce on its own, although the, uh, the glass might slightly. It's not going to affect this experiment at okay. all. We are going to place ultraviolet fluorescing liquids like we did in the flower into the water and due to some science if you want to look up the Rayleigh Taylor instability you can go and do that okay um, but it's going to create some uh, mushroom uh, jellyfish like shape sure as you drop these uh, little uh, um, fluorescing liquids into there Very and cool. that makes artwork and so we're a little bit lower than the surface of the water, angling up. Okay, and, and why is that? So that we can see the surface of the water in the resulting images, which will be a reflective surface. I appreciate you getting the uh, ink all over your fingers. So. Yeah, well, uh, I'm just priming your pipettes for you here, Chris. Done. So on, on this bowl, we have a nice little dividing line along the center. Okay. If you didn't have That's that- That's because it's a premium fish bowl that I bought. <laughs> exactly, it's, it's perfectly equipped. Yeah. Uh, if you didn't, you could just draw some lines halfway through so you knew exactly what the midpoint was. Right. Uh, and that's where you're going to be dropping down uh, your, your droplets. Okay. Put something in the way so that you can get that focus point on manual focus so that when you drop things down, your focus is going to be set. Now, I'm assuming it's gonna be intensely bright because as we saw, the fluorescing liquids really put out a lot of visible light. So uh, do you want a tighter aperture are we trying to get some depth of field to give ourselves a bit of space here? There's no focus stacking capability yeah, here. You can't combine all. multiple frames. So yes, the greatest depth 
uh, that you are comfortable with, F16, F22, something in oh, that neighborhood, gotcha. okay. uh, would allow you to kind of expand that. But this is somewhat abstract, and if things right. fall out of focus a little bit, that's okay too. Okay, I've got my camera set up, tripod ready to go. You've primed my pipettes, which I appreciate. Um, I guess we're ready to turn off the lights and give it a shot. Let's make it happen. All right. So tons of fun, Don, thank you so much. Like, I love how it's not so much about reviewing gear as just having fun with photography and trying something experimental. Uh, my pleasure, you know, this is fun because you can never repeat the same thing twice. It's right. always inventive, it's always creative. And once you've done it once, you wanna find a different way to do it the next time. Yeah. You wanna to try to just keep that creativity going. And, uh, you know, as a photographer, I am so often obsessing over gear. You know, yeah. you're reading the spec lists, lusting over the latest new lens or camera body, and this you can do with anything. It just, yeah. your creativity comes to the forefront. All right, Don, thank you so much. It is always inspirational when you come and join us. I really appreciate it. And you know, check out Don's Instagram page. That's where I actually see a lot of your ideas that inspire me personally. But you've got a new book out that's definitely worth looking at, talking about many different kinds of creative photography. If you wanna learn more as well, check out Don's podcast. You got lots of great guests. We love being on the podcast as well, Don. So thanks so much for having us on there. And thank you also, Michael Manis, for letting us use the studio space. The blocked out walls, although creepy at first, were actually ideal for this experiment, weren't they? And uh, don't forget, check out our Instagram and our Twitter feeds as well please subscribe to the channel but hopefully you guys found that educational can i take these glasses off now don it's not ideal is it gonna burn my eyes out i don't know are eyes important for photography i think so